So <laughs> this is <laughs> this is something we always talk about, and we usually ask it for the guys. Um, there's a study that says you are what you eat. Do you uh, believe it? <laughs> Do you believe it? You're sitting on stream, you're waiting for a position, and all of a sudden you have to poo. I have a high win rate because my targets are so short. It's only 10 pips. It's not that difficult to get 10 pips. What's up YouTube? We are back with another episode on the channel and today, no stranger to the channel, I've got the big man to my right, your left, Keegan van Dijk. Keegs. What's up, what's up Chad? How you doing? And then also special guest, also no stranger to the channel or the community, all the way to my right, your left, Miles van Wyk. What's up guys, how are we doing? How you doing well? Always good my man, always good. Miles, so we obviously the first podcast we did guys, I think that one is still on there, a little bit of uh, technical issues going on, but I felt we have to have another one, especially mm -hmm. now with TUT coming on. If you guys haven't checked it out, check vaultfinder.trade. Miles is going to be one of the mentors. And uh, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into who Miles is. Uh, where did Miles get onto the map? And now all of a sudden he's here with the two Gs streaming with us live every single morning, Monday to Friday. So Miles, um, I think for a lot of guys, some people that have not been on the channel, some people have, and sometimes we forget that people don't necessarily know your story. So give us a little bit of a backstory on Miles, where you grew up, how did you end up in Port Elizabeth, how you ended up in the trading scene. 100%, thanks Chris. So I'm actually originally from Cape Town. Um, however, I grew up most of my life in Port Elizabeth. Um, so trading for me has been a huge part of my life for the last eight years. I've been trading now for eight years. And um, this pretty much came from the idea that I've studied, I've worked, I've had a business, I've had two businesses, and um, the entrepreneur, my entrepreneurial mindset was always there. So when I stumbled upon trading, I feel like, as we spoke about earlier, um, it was nice because I could let that focus be on myself. I could use trading to equip myself with the capital that I need, to obviously venture into different things, not knowing at the time that I would grow a passion for it, that I'd fall in love with it and want to do it full time. Um, so when I started trading was back in 2017. Um, I went for a short course. Um, let's not mention his name. Okay. Uh, we won't give him that clout. And uh, what he ended up teaching me was a whole lot, a lot of, oh my gosh, I can't even say. It was so much nonsense now that I know what trading is. It's actually not even funny. So I paid this dude, I think about six grand at the time. Bear in mind, I was obviously a student, so it was a lot of money for me. Um, he also paid the dude six grand to teach me how to draw a trend line. Um, and that, if we know trading at this point, it's not worth it. So that for me showed me that, you know what? This trading thing is there. However, the way he's teaching me is just not how it should be done. So that being said, I then self-taught myself for about two and a half years and I then became profitable after two and a half years. I continued my journey and um, now tapping into the eight year mark, um, we've opened a company about four years ago called Milena FX, whereby we teach individuals what I do on a daily basis and how I do on a daily basis. And um, yeah, man, it's just been a great journey ever since. Three years ago, I became a six figure trader, um, leveling and scaling up my, my, my capital through obviously trading that personal capital. Um, and now obviously being in the space of uh, 2Gs has just been an awesome um, ride so far. But um, yeah, man, trading for me has definitely changed not only my life, but uh, the way I see things. It's more than just, you know, what you're doing on a daily basis. Obviously, you, yeah. you had that foundation that was set or that initial part of the trading where you mentioned where you paid for a course and then during your self-taught study, were there specific, um, I almost want to say knowledge outcomes or any specific, um, not even mentors, let's call it maybe trading influences, somebody on YouTube um, that you looked at, maybe took some of their concepts along the way, um, maybe some different concepts mm. that you took all together and then formed it into your own strategy. Were there some of them along the Look, way? Look at the... <clears throat> Back when I started trading, I mean, now we know that a lot of the traders that I would have looked up to back then was actually scammers now that mm -hmm. things are coming out. So back then there wasn't really concepts that I would take from a lot of people, but I did 
Google, I read a lot of books, I watched a lot of random YouTube videos to just start seeing a bit more information about the markets. Then once I started trying and testing certain different things, that's when I developed my edge in the market, um, where I saw, okay, um, the more I backtest, the more I try different things, I eventually am going to formulate a way of trading. So there won't be a specific person on YouTube or around the world that I say that I took a concept from, but more so just drips and drabs, storm P after storm P, putting that all together, and then through trial and error, a lot of trial and error, uh, eventually then figuring out my own way of trading. Yeah, Miles, I think taking it back just a little bit, um, obviously, like you were saying, you got into it in 2017, you were students and all this. The Obviously, I'd say they're still relatively young when you got into it, mm. but a lot of people, I think we even see guys starting to want to trade now when, they, when they're in high school already, they want to start learning the skill, which is, is awesome. Um, but how, how was it you came about trading? Like, I think a lot of guys today, I think everyone knows or sees trading somewhere on social media. But I think back in those days, I mean, social media wasn't even a big thing then. Yeah. So, so how was it you actually came across trading? Look, to be very transparent, uh, trading popped up because I saw some lighty driving his mom's Porsche. Back <laughs> at the time, I never knew that was that. But I was just like, you know what? I'm 18 years old at the time. Mm. Um, if he's 18, 19, how does, how, he have a how does he have that? What am I not doing? Um, and then also a friend of mine's brother was a trader as well. Um, and when I used to chill at their place, he'd always be trading. And I'd always be fascinated into it until one day he actually put like a trade in my phone. And then I made like a couple of dollars. And I'm like, oh, hectic. So if I put this in this phone, I can extract money out of it. That's crazy. And then I saw that dude on social media mm. selling his 5,000, 6,000 rand course. Um, and I was like, this is my time. This light, he has a Porsche. That's going to be me very soon. <laughs> and then obviously that's not how it went. But, um, you know, it was definitely the, the stepping stone for me to understand that, you know what, even though he's not teaching the right thing, it is definitely doable. And that's mm -hmm. what I've been striving for. Coming, coming back to your own strategy, and it's something I actually saw on Twitter earlier the week, the guy that's currently number one on the Robins World Cup. Um, he said it took him almost 10 years to reach profitability. It took him 15 years to where he's at now. And he made a very valuable point. He said, even if he had to sit down, show you his strategy in its fullness, he said a lot of guys would still not be profitable. And I think for you that have taught people along the way, um, you've obviously seen that you can teach somebody your strategy and they're still not profitable, mm. even though you give them all of the tools. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Uh, personally, I feel like it all boils down to hunger. How much do you actually want to succeed in this sort of field? Because a lot of people, they get punched twice in the face and they'll just back down. They won't have that hunger in them to actually persevere through the ebbs and the flows. Um, now, with that being said, everybody learns at their own pace, at their own journey. And the problem with today's time, I feel like because there's social media out there, that is actually what is hindering a lot of people's success. Because they may be in the trading game for, let's say, six months to a year. They haven't reached that point of profitability, but they're looking at the next person thinking, you know what, how is he at that point yet? How is he at that point already? Um, not knowing what that dude has gone through. Um, say, for example, they see me for the first time. They don't know what ebbs and flows I've been through to get to that point. So they just think that, oh, he's an overnight success. Um, there's many nights to reach that overnight success. So that's what I think it is. I feel like it's all about your hunger and also the perseverance behind that. Yeah, I think that that's 100%. I definitely agree with that. Um, but also going back to, to the trading itself now, I always say to people, and I think we've mentioned a few times on streams, mm -hmm. you get two types of traders. You get the guy who, they both have their strat, but you get the one guy if there's a chart, it moves, he trades it. Yeah. Then you get the guy who has his strat, but he knows where it works. He knows what he's good at and he sticks to that, whether that's one pair, two pairs, three pairs, but that's his bread and butter. Now, obviously, we know you have your, your strat that you do. And for guys that don't know, uh, we'll get Miles to elaborate on it, that you have your favorite pairs. Yeah. How, how did you come about that you selected those two pairs and that realizing the strat worked was it the thing of the pairs came first or did the strat come first which, which yeah. was the one so it was more because of how i started trading when i started trading i was actually a swing trader um so then i used to trade every single pair so with doing literally 
everything, I then filtered out what is not working. Um, so it's not more so per se what I could add to make my training better, but what can I remove? And that's where it boiled down to, I focused on which pairs are the most volatile. I focused on the routine around my life. When would I like to trade? So obviously I transitioned from being a swing trader to a day trader. So that was a big part of my life where I had to sit to myself and be like, um, if I formulate a routine around my life, at which point in time do I actually want to trade? Knowing that I can't trade for the whole day because mentally your brain can't do that. So then I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to focus on London session and then which pairs move the best in that time. So for me, I found then it was pound pairs. So then I did like GU, GJ, Euro pound. Um, I did all of them still being a swing trader at the time and then obviously involving uh, gold. Then it came down to a point where I would see eight setups across 10 different pairs. And then I wouldn't know which one to take because they're all setting mm. up almost, mm. you know, around the same time. And then it came to a point where I was like, you know what? What about I do the next step and start filtering out them as well? So I started to remove uh, pairs that wasn't as volatile, pairs that didn't have high pip increments, and I would focus on then pairs that would have higher pip increments, more volatile in the session than I would trade, and then through that I then found pound and then gold. Then the strategy was then developed purely off of GJ, uh, which is pound, yen, and, and, and uh, what I like to say the most important thing for me was because it was so volatile in London, I could get my move early in the morning and then I would be done. So that, that worked perfectly for me. Mm. Now, now coming back to that one and done, now you're a full-time trader, you trade, you wake up, you get ready for the day and 10 past nine, you're done with trading. What does the rest of the day look like? So to be honest with you, I could be here and like a, tell you all this fancy stuff, but it's literally just a normal day. It's nothing crazy. Um, sometimes I might even just go back to bed. Um, sometimes I might, well, in the day I have to go to gym. So it depends where I'm going to throw my gym. Is it going to be at 12 o'clock? Is it going to be at uh, the evening? But now um, it's going to be trading in the morning. I dedicate half past eight to half past 11 to the charts as well as my, all my students. If we are done early and we finish half past nine, if nobody has any questions or there's no extra meetings that I need to take care of with my clients, it's literally a free day for me and I can do what I want. Whether that be going to the gym, hanging out, whatever, it's a, it's a, easy, it's a easy day. Obviously not everybody is full-time traders. So what, have you ever found yourself in that situation where it's like, okay, you're done for the day, you've done your gym session. It's like some of your mates are still at work at the nine to five and now it's like, Dude, I'm bored. Yeah. I don't actually know what to do now. No, hundred percent. It happens. It really, it really happens. Um, which is so important that you have a routine and a discipline because you have that time left over. Your mind might be like, okay, I'm bored. Maybe I should go and trade again. When and that's not the case. Your discipline has to be so important, and that stems back to the why. Why are you trading? For why do you want to trade? What is the finances for? What is the time for? And then you utilize that. So you'll find me playing pedal at the random time doing this at the random time that's just how it is for me because i do have that time in my day that extra time yeah, but i think going going into that now a lot of guys i think if you're not in the the trading industry you don't understand how it works like yeah. we said like that for example you can trade be done by nine o'clock in the morning and now the rest of the day is open not that you're not being productive you're just you had your time zone you're productive and you made the most of for it for sure yeah how we always ask this question the guys because i mean you're still relatively young how was it when your family heard that you were going to go the trading route? Especially, I think, when you make that decision that you're going to go full-time. Yeah, yeah. Look, um, because I grew up with just my mother and my, my brother, um, it wasn't that hard for me to do so. I always believe that my mom supported me in everything that I do, um, which she proves on a daily basis. Um, she's literally like my rock besides God. So for me, the transition wasn't that hectic, although it was a big, huh? Is that something that you're going to do? But I must say through the process, she supported me thoroughly, even though she doesn't know what the heck trading is. She knows that if this is what my son has envisioned, um, because she's such a godly woman, she understands that everybody's visions and dreams and mm -hmm. um, purpose in life is different. Um, so I must admit she allowed me to go that route, drop me out of varsity, quitting my job. Even though it was a hectic time at the time, she supported me one way. Then coming back to the other one, so for, for the guys that have not traded full time, it's uh, it's a lonely it's a lonely thing you go through, um, and I still remember it. You would trade, and everyone would have their year in functions, and it's like year in function, and it's like you chilling at home. There's no year in function, <laughs> um, 
especially like even you can ask my wife you, you wake up in the mornings i help her get uh, get the kids ready for school they leave and i go sit in front of the charts sit there alone um, you analyze the charts you trade all of that and then very similar to you i would then cycle to gym all of that but there comes a point where you almost shut yourself off you become this like you enjoy being in your own space but also to the point where some mornings i would have let's say i slept in a little bit mm. and i would still sit in my pajamas in front of the charts and i'm like yeah about 12 o'clock still in pajamas and i'm like dude this this is not great for sure and um, that's why i felt for me personally i like to get ready get out of the house separate your let's call it your work from your home environment mm. otherwise there's no shutting off you're mm. like always at work technically if your office is there you're at work um do you feel now obviously it's still still early days do you feel it's a it's a better environment for you to like actually get ready for work now come to your office environment get ready for the stream where it just like breaks that a little bit so you know mm. like when you get here like switch on we're working in front yeah. of the charts now when you get home it's like okay now i can relax sit back a little bit for sure no 100 percent, definitely um but what i would have what i would have done and what i did do um in my past was have that routine exactly as i'm done with trading and there's maybe no client straight to the gym get in my car straight to the gym just so that that there's that like almost break away from the environment getting my ass to the gym doing what i got to do and then continuing the rest of my day um, and then also making sure that, um, look, obviously as traders, there's going to be those days where you just want to laze, you get in front of the charts in your pajamas, you're chilling, but 99% uh, of the time I'll try and actually shower before mm, I get, get to, to the, the charts, charts so that I feel refreshed at the charts and that my mind also switches over. So what I would do in, in my case at home is um, if I walk into my office, um, I would actually sit in front of the charts for 30 minutes, sit in front of the PC at least for 30 minutes before I actually actively analyze just so that my mindset can shift and be like okay you know what i'm in front of the charts right now this is what i gotta do let's do it so that would be me um especially because you would be at home um mm -hmm. all the time so that would help me and then obviously just running off to gym afterwards yeah so also miles like obviously now going into it, that you, you've been a full-time trader for quite a while um and this is always an interesting thing for guys because you mentioned how that you you found profitability i want to say relatively early in your trading career which i mean it's a good thing, not necessarily a bad thing, mm. but uh, everyone has that different. And even when you find that success in full time, there comes a period where, I mean, we've referred to it a few times as mm -hmm. going dark mode. Mm. You, you can always win, but the same as the charts, having a higher high, that higher low is going to come at some point. Um, whether, again, doesn't mean you go bankrupt, doesn't mean you lose everything, but you're going to go through a tough time uh, to get back to what you used to. Was there ever a period in your, your career so far since you've been full-time, whether it was before you were full-time, where you were going, damn, maybe maybe this isn't for me. Maybe uh, I can't do this as a, a career. 100%. So for me, I had two dark times. The first one was in that first year. So what I did was after I came back from the course and I did the course, I actually sold my car at the time and I put everything into trading. And I actually lost. Um, so the first two weeks, I think I put like, okay, back then for me, it was a lot. Um, I put 15 grand in the first two weeks. I lost it. Then I was like, okay, another 30 grand, put it in, lost it. That's when I started to obviously develop my strategy and work on it and know that, mm. you know, things can be good. So that was the first dark time. The second dark time is something I actually spoke about on stream earlier on, which was a mental dark time. So in 2019, I actually went through a heavy mental dip. Um, and that wasn't necessarily because of finance or anything like that, but more so because I think everything around trading and life just got to me. Um, I didn't actually open up and speak to people and, you know, just be transparent about like what's happening in my mental state. Mm. And that's when I went through a bit of a dip and I was out for like six months. So financially I was fine, all this was fine, but mentally I just wasn't there. But what I firmly believe is that God allows these tests to happen to us because it builds our character. It, allow, it allows us to develop um, a stronger uh, uh, character within ourselves. So I promise you, once I came back from that six months mental dip, everything just went haywire in a good sense because mm -hmm. 2019 was the year that i developed the current strategy that i have now and it's been standing strong ever since with that 80 percent win rate um, and above this year being that 87 percent win rate so i firmly believe that these dips in our lives with the higher lows in our lives it's not a complete 
defeat. It's literally just us to um, be tested, build that level of support, and then continue driving up within our lives because it's always going to happen at different points in your life. Mm-hmm. Do you do you ever feel, um, obviously for the guys, I don't know, you go for your team pips, and, and again, it's, a, it's an argument that a lot of people can have saying that, are oh, you trade negative or all of this? We've, we've talked about it before. Yeah. The, the entire thing is it's arbitrary. If Keegan trades without a stop loss, what is his ROR? Mm-hmm. If there's no stop and Keegan says, I've got a mental stop where I'm going to get out of the position and this is where I get out, then technically there's no ROR. But uh, coming back to that, was there ever a stage in your trading journey where you would take your 10 pips, you would sit and you would see that trade run 80 pips? Mm-hmm. And I'm talking about, let's say, four years ago. Just, yeah, uh, yeah. C19. Um, there were times when I would take a GJ trade and it would run 170 pips. And um, now I'm asking that question because I've also been at the 10 pip stage where I was trading it and I always had that thing in my mind and I'm sitting and I'm like, dude, I'm doing all of this work for 10 pips. Why not try and tweak a little bit to maybe get the 50 More, pips? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because uh, the, the position does the heavy lifting and it's not necessarily better, and this is not my story now, but f- uh, coming back to you, yeah. do you ever get that where you sit and it's like, flip, dude, now nah, I entered GJ, I took my 10, it ran another 80, and it would have never come back to my break even. For sure. I actually went through that uh, period of time when I was forward testing. So I obviously back tested the strategy, to develop the strategy, and then I started forward testing it. And that's when you're obviously at a point where you're trading it actively now with the live market. And then I'll be in a trade and I'm like, okay, cool, got my tempo, so I'm done. Then I'll come back to the laptop and I say, oh my word, this thing just ran like an extra 30 or extra 40. Why can't I not squeeze it more? Then I would try doing that. And then those trades that I tried to squeeze more ended up either being a loss or break even. Then I actually had to go back to the drawing board and go back through my back testing again. And then through my studies, it showed me that it's literally to a point where because this is something where I have to do it every day, um, I have to do it consistently. If I want to have it, uh, create profits in the long time, um, I need to find a medium. And the medium was between 10 and 20 pips every single day. And not to say that I have to trade every single day, but my movements that can happen with momentum is between 10 and 20 pips every day. And uh, a lot of people won't understand it because they might not be lacking education or a way of training, but they might be lacking capital, which means that their 1% on 10 pips might be only a dollar or $10. Mm-hmm. So it might not make monetary sense to them at the time. But if you use your mind and you think long-term, because this is a long-term game, trading is a long-term game, it's a business. Um, for it to be sustainable, you need to be compounding your account through the long-term. So for me, it was an understanding that a lot of people won't understand that concept because they're looking at, oh, I just made only a dollar or five dollars, ten dollars a day. However, if you can use that to your advantage by developing your skill and then use that to say, you know what, it might only be five dollars today, but five years from now, what could there be? A thousand dollars, five thousand dollars. There's no limitations. So when I went and back tested that and I went through it all again, then I found, wow, in the long term, in the long term, this is something that will be sustainable and I can do it continuously and that is what we're doing Uh, talking on that um how did you basically edge up your lot sizes because this is some issue that i see in the industry guys would want to go from trading one lot this week they have a phenomenal week or two weeks and now all of a sudden they on three lots for sure that's when they go maybe through a tougher week then they come back to the Mm. one lot and then it's that death loop we talk about so what was your scaling plan? Did you have like a plan to say every quarter, I'm going to try and up my lot, say by 10%? Um, or did you trade a constant lot size maybe for a year, two years, three years? Um, how did you scale up and what was your plan in scaling up to the lot sizes you're trading? Now? So what helped me a lot in my scaling up was using fixed lots. That was probably the best thing that I could have done. However, in the beginning days of my trading, obviously I wasn't as educated as I am right now. So percentage wasn't really a huge thing for me. So I would actually high risk all my trades and that is how I compounded my accounts to get so large so quick. Now that is not something that is sustainable. It was very high risk, but it 
I did it at that time. So now it's more perspective of, okay, I'm going to risk one to 3% with a fixed lot. And that is how I compound the account. Now it won't be something that I'm going to change monthly, quarterly, or even yearly. It might take me two years at this point where I am right now. It might take me two years to change to my next lot size. And that is purely just based off of portfolio growth. Um, once you start managing larger capital, yes, it is easier to make more money because you have more money available, but by still sticking to that same portfolio percentage, it's not wise to just go willy nilly with the lot sizes. So I've been still, I've been using the same lot size now for the past year, um, which started in Jan. Prior to that though, my lot size was the same for two years. I didn't change it. Reason being, I had to reach a certain bracket of capital before I could go to mm. the next level. Not only is it the money thing behind it, but also a mental state. Because now, even my transition this year was going from 1% to 3%, which means that a 1% loss then is now three losses of that 1% now, because I'm risking 3% now. So it wasn't just the money thing that was a change. It was more the psychology and the mental state behind it, being able to actually mentally cope with that. Um, and that is why I firmly believe that your time is your time. Don't try and speed it up. Don't be willy-nilly with your, not, your lot sizes. Don't try and go back and forth. Find your fixed lot according to your percentage and then stick with that until that account starts to develop growth within it. Oh, no, I love that because uh, you know what? It lines up quite often with, uh, we've always said this with guys, we always talk about compound being the next wonder. Yeah. And it's the same thing with accounts. Even when we look at the prop firms, the guys want to get a, a 50k account and then make 30% on the account. Mm. Where you know what? You can get two, three, four of the accounts, make 4% on each account, which is a lot more achievable. Mm. And now before you realize you've done it 12, 20%. But you've taken that strain of pushing the limits and the boundaries on every yeah, single yeah. account. So it's a very nice to hear that you have someone that has the same approach. And I think that also goes into, um, I actually want to touch on it a little bit, uh, a hot topic in SA at the moment Ooh, is the FSEA coming down <laughs> on everyone. Sure. Now, sure, sure, sure. we obviously know, obviously, Miles joining the team now, you've been doing things the right way. You are very transparent. You're not uh, teaching this millions of a night long yeah. idea to people like you say it's compound it's time you you had your own pace your own race um but we always knew this this cleanup was going to come in the industry sometime so i just want to know what do you what do you think from your if they say insights and how you've always viewed the market and stuff and like we said they were the guys we used to look up to ourselves yeah. who we find out we're scammers and things like this what do you think the future is for the the forex industry uh, with how the FSEA is coming in so hot now with everyone. Yeah. Look, the future for me personally is something that is much more cleaner. Um, all these fools and gurus that's running around continuously posting things like, let's just say flex points. Um, that already is a huge red flag for me. My thing has always been this, and I, I stand on business when I say this since day one. I don't want to see a meta trader. You can mm -hmm. get test accounts for that. I don't want to see a car. It can be your mom's car. I don't want to see a house that can be rented. I don't want to see anything that is not live trading. If you can't live trade in front of me, I don't believe that you can trade. So that also being said, I feel like a lot of the people that have a huge following on social media, people can hate me for this. They can't actually trade. So that being said, I feel like because this cleanup is going to come right now, it's going to be better for the industry. But most importantly, I hope that people can get that wake up call, not the mentors, not the gurus, not the gurus, none of that, but the actual people that pay for the courses, they can actually start to ask questions like, Hey, do you have licensing? Hey, let's see you live trade. Simple questions like that. That is, you are coming, <laughs> coming back to the live training, um, Rydal actually, I think it was Rydal. I watched the one thing and he, he spoke about it. And it's like, you go to one of these mentors and you're like, all right, teach me how to fish and you pay them <laughs> and, and they're standing on the shore and they show you how to get your line connected. You put on your hook. This is how you put on the bait. And then it's like, okay, I paid you now. I'm set up now. Yeah. My rod is ready. Like come out with me to see, let's go catch a fish together. And it's like, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll stand on the side. Like I'll push your boat in. You go and fish. And it's the weirdest thing for me where people will pay money with the expectation that they don't want to let that guy fish with them. And yeah. it's like you said now, 
Like, if you're going to teach me how to fish, I want to see your rod in the water as well. Like, I want to see what you're doing. And that should actually be a standard. Even mm. if you do it, let's say a lot of guys want to gatekeep it. They, they want to do it to a closed community. That's fine. But I feel like if you are a trader, you need to be doing it live. For you sure. need to be yeah. sitting at a desk. This thing of you trading the financial market, sitting in a coffee shop. I don't see any Wall Street uh, traders sitting with a bagel, a cappuccino and their phone and they're mm. investing money. For like, sure. have, have, we, <laughs> have we really made trading that cheap? Yeah. And that like almost fake where it's like other people doing, let's say, a less stressful job, an easier job. Yeah. They're at their desk working. Mm. And now we portray this thing where I'm sitting at a coffee shop and, oh, I'm making money, yeah, little yeah. blue screen. And I feel like anyone watching, that should be the minimum. If a mentor is going to charge you money for something, let him show you how to catch a fish. Let him show you how to cost. And if they can't live trade in front of you and they'll, they'll always have stories that I'm sending you a signal, this, that. No, yeah. sit in front of your people. Sit with them. Fish mm -hmm. with them. That should be the minimum standard, I feel. Yeah. Look, even as mentors like, like we are... Um, my thing is this, if you're conducting business, right, you as the person that's running the show, wouldn't you think, wow, you know what? I'm offering them this product. Let me show them how this product is implemented. Mm -hmm. For me personally, I pro obviously provide a course. People can study that, all that stuff. But I've seen so much growth in my clientele just based off the fact that I'm sitting there and they're trading alongside of me. Obviously not physically, but on Zoom, yeah. we're sitting with one another. They see how I take the trade. Not only is, are they seeing how the strategy is then implemented, but they're able to then ask questions. Hey, man, why did you take that long at that point? Why did you take that short at that point? That alone is worth a million bucks. Mm -hmm. if you, if you It's priceless. Um, being able to tell the person, look here, exactly what you just read about just happened right now. And you saw me do it. This is how you can do it too. Mm. You know, Miles, I'm going to take it back again just a, a little bit because uh, I think this is a question... Quite often guys get asked uh, when they, the fact that people know you dabble in that is, I think we obviously mentioned a few times that you do go to the gym quite often. Mm. You do look after your health. Um, and this is a topic that always goes around and I don't know why, but guys think, I don't know, it's a cliche thing. It's a myth to me if we just talk about it. But what is your idea on this whole healthy body, healthy mind? You look after yourself do you see that carry over into your trading as well? Or do you think 100%. it's just personally, uh, hey, I, I want to have some muscles and look good? No, 100%. You can't have six figures with no six pack. And vice versa. Hey, I love um, it. I love it. <laughs> my my thing has just, <laughs> my okay. thing has just always been like, as a trader, you're going to be stressed out. As a trader, you're going to overthink. There's a lot of great things going through, through your mind. So you want that breakaway. So for me, when I go to the gym and I get that dopamine, I just feel good about myself. Confidence outside of the charts brings confidence into the charts. So it's not that you're walking around Vinchat, but you just feel better about mm -hmm. yourself when you go get that haircut, when you go to the gym, and you just feel so much better. Why not then transition that confidence then obviously into your trades? So I stand on that firmly. Your four pillars, which is your mental, your physical, your psychological, and your emotional. And that all falls into one another with obviously your spiritual being on top. So making sure that God is number one through everything I do, I put him there and then mentally making sure that I go to the gym to obviously clear my brain. And then obviously, if you're not having your mental state in the right, in the right position, how are you going to regulate, regulate your emotions? How are you going to feel better? And then with that being said, through that, then obviously hitting the gym for that. So <laughs> this is... <laughs> There's something we always talk about and we usually ask it for the guys. Um, there's a study that says you are what you eat. Do you uh, believe yeah. it? <laughs> Do you believe it? Look, at the end of the, <laughs> end of the day, um, I can literally, because I come from where I was 107 kgs yeah, and yeah. then I went on a solid cut. So and you I, agree you are what you eat? Yeah. Now we go. <laughs> in, a, in a sense like this, okay. where, where we think of it, how we feel. Because my thing is, I've never eaten a sexy beast. Jesus <laughs> <laughs> Christ. <laughs> you guys can never, <laughs> ever, you guys can never, ever talk about that health stuff. I'm, you always walk. <laughs> <laughs> on that. My thing, you my you thing, up, bro. My thing is, I saw bro. you walking right into that one, bro. <laughs> the, the, the thing is, I thought, 
I thought Keegan was like setting me up for it. Like he was like, Chris, <laughs> run on my shoulder. I'm going to block the guy. I'm going to offload you straight. <laughs> the thing is, I saw Mo's eyes and I was like, slowly. And you're like, fuck. I'm oh, walking no, into something. Yeah. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I'm uh, walking into something. That's, yeah. Sorry, man. That's a classic old dad joke I always tell. And uh, especially when you're like in, in health circles and I'm, I, I'm always like, so do you guys really think you are what you eat? And they give me this entire thing of yard, yeah, this and that. And I'm like, then I need to stop eating sexy beef. Right. And they're like, oh, dude, you're not serious. Get uh, out of the gym, yeah. <laughs> Run away. Look, my, my thing is like, you don't have to be the fittest, dude. You don't have to eat clean 100% of the time. But having that balance is super important. I've literally yeah, seen yeah. it in my life. Um, you feel different. You just feel different when you eat better, when you look after yourself. Mm. Now, I think, uh, I think trading, like you mentioned, it is a, it is a stressful environment. It's the one of the few jobs where there's immediate um there's either immediate loss mm. or there's like immediate gain where previously like let's say you're in a job you make a mistake oh you didn't attach the email whatever there's not like you you get reprimanded mm. it's like dude you didn't attach the email but with trading every de decision is monetary based For sure. like there's a monetary result to it and there comes a stage where it's like every decision I make here is either going to cost me X amount of money or I could potentially make X amount of money. And that's the pressure I think a lot of traders can't deal with. Yeah. Where mm -hmm. it's a case of you're so used to the 9 to 5 grift where it's I've worked my 9 to 5, I get my salary at the end of the month. Now with trading it's like nothing's guaranteed. Mm, and now yeah. also it's that's uh, the pressure is there i take a trade i might lose immediately i might make money and this comes back to again where you can teach somebody the strategy but psychologically they're not there yeah. and they might never ever get there that is the unfortunate thing with trading is that somebody can stick around with it and psychologically, they'll just never be able to adapt to that type of stress environment. Mm -hmm. No, no, I totally agree. Look, at the end of the day, um, I feel like trading is all what you make of it. In the beginning, when you look at trading, it might be a different perspective. But as time goes on, it should start to adapt. Um, yeah, I, t I totally agree with you. Definitely. On what, that. what is some of the, now you obviously being a mentor, what is some of the, I, I want to say, correlations or some of the sticking points, uh, especially with newer traders and maybe traders that have had some experience in the past, like what are some of the common themes you see pop up that the guys struggle with? Uh, definitely over leveraging. People think that they can flip 500 bucks to a million rand in a week. I, I've, I've $100 to a million. Um, that's one of the things um, I know a lot of people also st struggle with uh, FOMO. Uh, missing a trade and wanting to jump on. And then also, I think the biggest thing throughout my, my mentoring career is just patience. People lack patience so much. I was uh, a person of that as well. I just never had the patience to wait for a setup or to wait to even get to that point of, okay, it's $100 today, but in my head I'm thinking I want $10,000. Not being patient enough to wait for that to compound. Mm -hmm. um, when that is part of the journey, you have to be patient. I think that's one of the biggest ones. So would you then say, thinking back to it now, you mentioned FOMO. That's patience. Yeah, yeah. Over leveraging, again, patience because you're not willing to walk the road. So yeah. you want that big money now. Yeah. And then also, now this is the thing. If you miss a trade, and this is always what I ask the guys, how did you miss a trade? How do you classify as a trade being missed? Because a lot of times... Me and Keegan, we've said it to the guys on stream as well. They get to the charts. Oh, I missed US 30. I'm like, you didn't miss it because mm. if it was your plan to trade, you would have been at the desk. And secondly, if the trade happened in front of you and you didn't execute, then it wasn't your plan. For then sure. you didn't miss anything. You, sure. you look at the move and it's like, oh, you missed. You didn't miss. Yeah. So for you, what do you classify as a missed trade? Perfect example. This is going to be the best example I can give. It might be a little bit of a luck. So I was on stream not so long ago, and one of my students was obviously watching my stream. Not that we give financial advice, none of that stuff, but obviously I was about to take a trade, and because he or she knows the MFX strategy as well, he or she planned to take the same trade. Um, so literally he missed the trade because he went and warmed up a Shamrock Pie. 
So that is why that <laughs> is, he, warm up. he went and he was waiting for the trade to come. And he warmed up. And he pie. went and warmed up a pie, came back, miles he 10 to 10 pips P, uh, TP. So <laughs> that's a perfect example as a, as a trade miss. But I guess that trade just wasn't meant for him. Okay, serious question as well. Um, this is something I think, I don't think Keegan has battled it before, but me personally, I've battled it. Um, you're sitting on stream, you're waiting for a position. And all of a sudden, you have to poo. <laughs> this is no, this is real, guys. This is real talk. Like we talk all of this fancy <laughs> stuff. My question is, you know the trade is busy setting up. Do you go to the toilet? A, you go and drop the load, or do you crunch it and you wait for your setup first? <laughs> like it, Chad, like we've had this on screen. <laughs> like I'm asking real, qu I've real life this, questions. I've had this as well. Okay, there, like there I wake up maybe real, a little bit later. I haven't stuff. got that morning drop of my kids at the pool. Yeah, by. yeah, yeah. Um, and it would be a simple, it would be a simple uh, statement like, guys, my garden is here. I have to open for him. Okay. Or a simple statement, guys, someone came to you, go. and then I have to go drop a deuce. But but here's the thing though: if the trade setup is happening, do you pinch it? Like have to. You, you have, have to. to trading first. There you go, have to. bro. Tough, there you bro. go. Trading that's first. That's it's, it's all. That's why we jump. Your glutes. You gotta. You gotta squeeze that clutch control, bro. You gotta do. Uh, have you ever had that issue where you had? I had to like consider like do I rather I'm pretty sure I have it so <laughs> yes dude I've had I don't it. know how you don't so the amount of coffee we drink in our office yeah. <laughs> right? but I feel like these are the type of obstacles guys always talk about risk management all of this this is type this is of, the real life obstacles this you is do. the real stuff that people don't realize you have to go through these are exactly. the decisions you have to make like do I have that coffee early in the morning to get that biological clock going before the trading session? Or do I run the risk of having that biological clock mm. kick in during stream? Yeah. And um, I feel like these are the li real life events guys don't speak <laughs> For about. For me, it's always like if that comes to a point where that happens and the trade plays out perfectly, I was thinking that was the most, most expensive shit I've ever had. <laughs> like I just took a shit to miss out on three grand. Come on now. Uh, but I think, guys, as, as we, we're getting close to the end of this, um, I think there's one more topic we need to touch on. And Miles, that's obviously the big one. Uh, season two of the Ultimate Trader coming up. You have been announced as one of the mentors. Uh, what, what is it you think you're going to bring to the table that one of the other coaches personally maybe won't? Or that you think you can even prove to them uh, that makes you the the better coach in 100%. this competition. So we can just rectify that not just one of the other coaches, but all of the other coaches. Um, we'll definitely show them how and what it is to be a consistently profitable trader. That as a six-figure trader, as a matter of fact. Um, so a lot of people have the the nonchalant understanding regarding negative RR. They always think about now oh, we need the one to twos, the one to threes. Um, it will literally just be me showing them the realism behind it. What is consistently profitable in an eight year span and still to come. Um, so with the 87% win rate, I know for a fact a lot of the mentors, probably all of them, is definitely going to learn something. Then coming back to that post, I think we, we didn't even chat about it. So obviously getting some flack. And, and again, it's an it's a outlier case. Um, how do you deal with some something like that in the case where you say, hey guys, here's my stats. Uh, I live trade all of this. I've got an 87% win rate. And then somebody's like, bro, you don't have an 87% yeah, yeah. win rate. How do you deal with that? Look, at the end of the day, it's not something that I need to deal with because it's not going to phase me. Um, just because I've come to realize through my entire journey, especially the way I trade um, regarding negative R, people don't understand the concept. I have a high win rate because my targets are so short, which is only 10 pips. It's not that difficult to get 10 pips. Which means that even though my stops is larger, if I have the consistency in having more wins, I'll be profitable. So for me, when I get like chatter about the way I trade, for me personally, they aren't paying my bills. They don't do my withdrawals. They don't see the money coming to my account. It doesn't matter for me. And the best part about it is it would be a different story if I had said, hey guys, I have 87% win rate, but all I do is sell courses like 99% of South African gurus. Yeah. However, I live trade every single day for the whole year I've done it. I've proven live that this is the trades I've taken and it has produced that. So if somebody can't comprehend what is happening, then maybe they need to double check what school they went to.
I think we, we're starting to wrap it up here to the end. And I think for, for anyone watching, most of the guys, everyone's looking for some type of advice. Somebody's looking maybe for a little bit of motivation. Um, everyone's trying to piece this puzzle of trading. And is there any uh, advice, any words of encouragement that you maybe want to give any one of the traders out there, maybe aspiring traders that maybe have been in the game for long on the verge of giving up just maybe a word some words what, of encouragement what's some the, advice. the golden nugget from miles i think the golden nugget is to realize that this is real trading is real it's here to stay it's what you make of it the success lies in what you do so as long as you persevere through everything whether it be the blown accounts the funded challenges that aren't being passed um, battles at home focus on what your goal is and why you are here why are you using trading as a tool to level up your life stick to that every single day and through that your, your perseverance will come thanks Here guys really appreciate it that's been another episode with miles check in the link in the description if you want to see miles social handles also you can catch miles live every monday to friday with me on the london session you can check it out to just uh, trading Hit that like button, subscribe, and we will see you guys on the next one. And if you have not done so yet, check out the Ultimate Trader Season 2 is going live 4th of November. Miles being one of the mentors, so we're going to see how he fares. 87% win rate, is that going to result in his team winning? I don't know, but we will see. Keeks, thank you so much. Any closing remarks before we close uh, off here? No, nah, was a good one. I think it was very insightful, guys. We've always said to you, we will always keep it real, raw, and we will only have the most legit on this channel. Uh, so again, Miles, thanks for being here. Thanks for having this awesome episode. And again, welcome to the team, my brother. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Awesome chat. Peace and love, baby. See you guys in the next one. Cheers, cheers.